Okay, uh, so welcome to today's Wednesday seminar. Sorry for the uh, delay, we had a few IT issues. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners and custodians of the land with which we are meeting today and pay my respects to their elders past and present and also to embrace their continuing custodianship of this land. Uh, it's my great pleasure today to uh, um, host uh, the Wednesday seminar and uh, which doubles as a PhD completion talk uh, by Stephanie Trisice. So Steph and I go back uh, a long ways. Uh, she originally joined my lab uh, as a Europe student and then through honours and now her PhD. And for both the, the latter two projects, uh, Steph's been really focused on plasma cells. And these are the cells in our body that produce the uh, protect, protective uh, antibody that uh, keep us safe from infections. And of course, even the person in the street knows in 2020 that these are important uh, uh, population for this function. Uh, plasma cells also, has, also have a flip side, uh, too many plasma cells and the production of autoantibody is, is a major uh, contributor to very common autoimmune diseases. So Steph's project is really um, centred on understanding, uh, using a genetic screening approach, what uh, holistically how plasma cells tick. So what makes them live, what makes them home to the right place, what makes them do the right things. And how they can manage to produce this vast amount of antibody uh, for such a long period of time. And of course, if we understand better how plasma cells tick, we'll have a better way to, to sort of toggle their function uh, when we want to promote or dampen immunity. Uh, the, the, that project is really simple to sketch out. It took me, took me uh, like uh, five minutes to think it up. Uh, but it's really quite a, a, a challenging project to execute, uh, particularly on rare and live cells. And it requires a, a number of talents. Um, you have to be smart, you have to be uh, determined and you have to have really excellent organisational skills. And I think you'll see from, from Steph's talk that she has all these traits in abundance and has made a really stellar job of, uh, of uh, pushing through this project. So Steph, it's been a great pleasure to have you in the lab and we look forward to your seminar which is titled Identifying the Novel Regulators of Antibody Secreting Plasma Cells. So antibody secreting cells is the collective name for plasma blasts and plasma cells, which are the populations of terminally differentiated B cells. Antibody secreting cells, as their name suggests, are the cells within our body that are responsible for producing antibodies. They form a really critical part of our adaptive immune response to infection, especially in our long-term protection from reinfection, as these cells have the capacity to live for years up to the entire lifespan of an organism and throughout their lifespan, they will continue to produce protective antibodies. But despite the importance of these cells, we still lack a really detailed understanding of the factors that drive their biology. Advances in our understanding of how these cells are regulated in a regular immune response can help us to understand the causes of immune disorders, such as immunodeficiencies. This knowledge can also inform us of new avenues of treatment for antibody secreting cell-based pathologies, such as autoimmune diseases, where antibodies directed against the self are drivers of pathology. It can also inform us of new treatments for multiple myeloma, which is a cancer of antibody secreting cells. And finally, a more defined understanding of the factors that promote long-lived antibody secreting cell generation may assist us in boosting the immune response following vaccination. And I think that we can all appreciate, especially given the current COVID-19 situation, the importance of understanding how we can best design vaccines to produce a long-lived and protective immunity. This is a basic overview of the B-cell differentiation pathway. There are three subsets of B-cells, follicular B-cells, marginal zone, and B1 cells. All of these cells will express a B-cell receptor. For the majority of my talk today, I'm going to be talking about this follicular B-cell population and their differentiation process. However, at the end, I'm going to touch on some work that I've done on this B1 population. So once activated, B-cells can differentiate into a short-lived, rapidly proliferating population of cells called plasmoblasts. And these cells will produce a secreted form of the B-cell receptor, which is what we call an antibody. <coughs> 
Alternatively, follicular B cells can form a structure known as a germinal center. Cells that are within this germinal center will undergo a mutation process in their antibody encoding genes, which will alter their affinity for antigen. Ultimately, the cells with the highest affinity for antigen will be selected out and will either become memory B cells, which retain a B cell phenotype, but are capable of more rapid differentiation on re-exposure, or they'll become plasma cells, which are a long-lived, non-dividing population of antibody-secreting cells. This differentiation process is generally talked about as being referred to as a triad of transcription factors, BLIMP1, IRF4, and XBP1. BLIMP1, which is encoded by the gene PRDM1, is essential for the terminal differentiation of both B and T lymphocytes. Its major function is as, 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 is as a transcriptional repressor, and it silences the expression of genes important for B cell identity. IRF4 is an essential driver of B cell differentiation as it's needed to induce the expression of BLIMP1. It is also essential for the survival of antibody secreting cells, as the deletion of IRF4 in plasma cells in vivo results in the rapid loss of this population. Plasma cells perform a massive amount of antibody synthesis, which makes them extremely sensitive to endoplasmic reticulum stress, and they are therefore reliant on ER stress responses such as the unfolded protein response. XBP1 is a major regulator of the unfolded protein response and is upregulated in antibody secreting cells. Differentiation is possible in the absence of XBP1, however the secretion capacity of these cells is severely diminished. It is, however, highly likely that there are additional genes which are important for the generation, maintenance and functioning of plasma cells. To gain a better understanding of the factors that regulate plasma cell biology, our lab has previously been involved in examining the changes in gene transcription that occur throughout this differentiation process. This project involved performing RNA-seq on each of these populations and comparing their transcriptomes to identify a core group of genes shared by antibody secreting cells. And these genes are what we call the antibody secreting cell gene signature. This gene signature is a list of 301 genes whose expression is upregulated in antibody secreting cell subsets compared to follicular B cells. 257 of these genes are also upregulated, uh, 257 of these genes have direct human homologs, and 201 of those are also upregulated in human antibody secretion differentiation. Within this list are many of the well known regulators of plasma cell function, such as XBP1 and BLIMP1. But many of the genes in this list have no previous association with plasma cell biology, and some genes remain completely uncharacterized. We believe that it's highly likely that this gene signature will be enriched for the genes that mediate B cell differentiation, survival, homing, and antibody secretion. And my project focuses on interrogating this gene signature to identify novel factors important for the generation and functioning of plasma cells. So my project is based on this hypothesis, that the antibody secreting cell gene signature will be enriched for the genes that are important for antibody secreting cell differentiation, survival, proliferation, and antibody secretion. With the main goal of my project to identify positive and negative regulators of antibody secreting cell differentiation and of antibody secretion. As I mentioned earlier, I've also done some work looking at the role of IRF4 in B1 cells, which I'll touch on briefly at the end of my talk. To address my first two aims, however, I turned to using CRISPR-Cas9-based screens on primary mouse B cells. So to answer the first question of which genes within the antibody secreting cell gene signature are important for antibody secreting cell generation, survival, and function, I developed an in vitro screening assay, which allows me to individually target each gene within the antibody secreting cell gene signature and to measure the effect of its disruption on a range of parameters. I've used an arrayed screening approach, firstly, because performing a pooled screen will not allow me to identify genes involved in antibody secretion, and secondly, because I wanted to perform this screen on primary cells, 
And doing this in an arrayed format will allow me to do this with much smaller cell numbers than what would be required to reach the desired library coverage for a pooled screen. This is the experimental overview for the screens that I've used. Firstly, I isolate naive splenic B cells from Cas9 transgenic mice, and I activate these cells with LPS. I've used this stimulation condition because it induces a really strong differentiation response. And therefore, I should clearly be able to identify genes that are essential for this process as they will cause a reduction in differentiation. After 24 hours, I transduced my cells with my guide RNAs using an arrayed lentiviral library that I've generated. This library contains two, genes, uh, two guides against each gene within the antibody secreting cell gene signature. Each of these guide constructs also contains the fluorescent marker BFP, which will allow me to identify transduced cells by flow cytometry. After a further three days in culture, I can analyze cell number and differentiation by flow cytometry and can evaluate antibody secretion by performing ELISAs on the culture supernatants. But before I could do this screen, I first needed to optimize every stage of this process to be performed in a 96 well plate. I won't go into this in a lot of detail, but just to say that I've optimized the transfection of 293 T cells in a 96 well plate to a format where I'm able to get above 90% transfection with my guide RNAs consistently, as shown here by the expression of BFP. This method was also easily scalable, so I was able to perform up to 96 individual transfections in parallel. Secondly, I optimized the transduction of my primary mouse B cells to a stage where I can consistently get around 80% transduction with my guide RNAs. To test that this assay was going to be suitable, I transduced cells with guide RNAs targeting IRF4 or PRDM1, which encodes BLIMP1, as both of these are essential for antibody secreting cell differentiation. Targeting either of these genes resulted in a clear loss of differentiation as measured by the proportion of CD138 positive cells. I saw really good agreement between each of the guides that I used for each gene. I also transduced cells with guide RNAs directed against another gene, PPAPDC1B. And we know that this gene has no influence on B cell differentiation, proliferation, survival, or antibody secretion. As expected, these PPAPDC1B transduced cells were able to differentiate at the same frequency as the uninfected controls. Together, this clearly shows that despite the short time frame of this screening assay, it will clearly be able to identify genes essential for B cell differentiation. I also needed to ensure that this assay was going to be sensitive enough to determine, to determine decreases in antibody secretion. As expected, targeting either IRF4 or PRDM1 resulted in a clear decrease in antibody secretion, while targeting PPAPDC1B, which again has no influence on the secretion process, did not. Therefore, this assay is clearly going to be able to identify genes that are essential for both differentiation and antibody secretion. The antibody secreting cell gene signature contains 301 genes and I've determined the influence of each of these genes on differentiation, survival, proliferation, and antibody secretion. What I'm showing you here is the fold change in the proportion of CD138 positive, or differentiated cells, for each gene relative to the control on each assay plate. Each dot repre represents the average fold change of both guides against the same gene from two replicate screens. I've arbitrarily set my cutoff for genes of interest as having an at least 50% reduction in the proportion of differentiated cells, and these genes are shown here in red. As expected, targeting IRF4, PRDM1, or SDC1, which is the gene that encodes the marker CD138, all resulted in a clear reduction in the proportion of CD138 positive cells. The other two genes that influence the proportion of differentiated cells were HSPA5, which encodes GRP78, or BIP, and SEC61A1, which is the major subunit of the SEC61 complex. Both of these are important for the import of newly synthesized polypeptides into the endoplasmic reticulum and for preventing protein misfolding. And importantly, both of these have previously been linked to antibody secreting cell generation and function. <laughs> 
Somewhat surprisingly, though, is that these appear to be the only genes within the antibody-secreting cell gene signature that are absolutely essential for differentiation to occur. I've also used this screen to identify genes that affect either survival or proliferation of B cells. Within the antibody-secreting cell gene signature, I found 10 genes that affected the total live cell number. Among these genes was a collection of ribosomal genes, and it's somewhat unsurprising that targeting ribosomal genes would affect cell survival. HSPA5, SELK, and VCP are all important for protein folding and the degradation of misfolded proteins. If cells accumulate misfolded proteins within their ER, this will cause stress, and if this stress is left unresolved, it can cause cell death. In addition to this, SELK has previously been implica implicated in promoting T cell proliferation. SUMO2 is a small ubiquitin-like protein which has, the role, has a role in the regulation of a range of cellular processes, including cell cycle control, gene expression, and genome stability. Previous work has shown that SUMO2 knockout cells have decreased proliferation and increased cell death compared to wild type. The literature surrounding this remaining gene, however, CDV3, offers no clear reason as to why targeting it would influence some number. So this is obviously a very intriguing candidate for further investigation. Although looking at the total cell number does suggest that either survival or proliferation may be affected, we need a more sophisticated approach to begin to tease apart the effects on each of these parameters. By performing a time course assay with a division tracking die, I will be able to clearly see whether targeting these genes is causing a proliferative defect. Unfortunately, using this system, I can't conclusively say whether or not survival is also being affected, as I'm unable to assess any cell death that would be occurring in the 48-hour window between transduction with my guide RNAs and maximal BFP expression. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with division tracking dyes, you start by labeling your cells with a fluorescent dye that can be detected by flow cytometry. Each time the cells divide, this dye will be split equally between the daughter cells, which will then be half as bright as the undivided cells. So by looking at the changes in fluorescence, you can determine how many times a cell is divided. For the next experiments, I labeled my Cas9 B cells with the division tracking dye cell trace yellow, or CTY, activated them, after 24 hours I introduced my guides, and then at multiple time points I looked at CTY fluorescence. So firstly, here's an example of a gene which we already know has no influence on B cell proliferation, PRDM1 or BLIMP1. As you can clearly see, the profile of the CTY dilution from the guide transduced cells almost perfectly overlays with the division profile of the untransduced cells, confirming that there is no difference in B cell proliferation when you knock out BLIMP1. And this is what it looks like when you target one of the hits from my screen, SUMO2. You can see that in comparison to the untransduced cells in gray, the SUMO2 knockout cells in red have divided fewer times at every examined time point. So clearly, SUMO2 has an effect on B cell division. I've used this CTY assay to assess which of my screen hits have an influence on B cell proliferation. And with the exception of VCP, they all had a clear effect on cell division but the gene that had the most striking effect was CDV3. As you can see here, the cells transduced with CDV3 guide RNAs have this really striking proliferative defect. And interestingly, CDV3 has no previous link to cell division. To determine whether CDV3 might have a similar function in human cells, I transduced two human multiple myeloma cell lines, OPM2 and MM1S, with guide RNAs targeting CDV3. You can see that over the course of nine days, the proportion of CDV3 knockout cells was reduced, suggesting that either their survival or their proliferation is impaired. And therefore, CDV3 is likely having a similar role in human cells to what I saw in the primary mouse B cells. So what do we know about CDV3? In short, not a lot. Its full name is carnitine deficiency associated protein found in ventricles number three, 
and there's currently only one published paper looking at it. This paper suggests that it's phosphorylated by ABL kinase in pro-B cells. Its expression seems to be mainly restricted to immune cells, specifically in pro-B cells, antibody secreting cells, and double negative thymocyte populations. If you look at the sequence of CDB3, it has no homology to any other mouse proteins and no shared functional domains. If we look at the conservation of CDB3 throughout evolution, you can see that with the exception of exon 1, it's reasonably well conserved, with large regions having almost 100% conservation from zebrafish through to humans. So what we have here is essentially an unstudied gene that's highly conserved, has a striking phenotype, and its expression is almost exclusively restricted to the B cell lineage. Clearly, this is an ideal candidate for further investigation. And the most interesting first question is, what does CDV3 do in vivo? To answer this question, we've generated a CDV3 knockout mouse model. A CDV3 is expressed in both developing B cells and antibody secreting cells, we've made an inducible model where the expression of Cree will result in the excision of exon 3, which is the exon that both of the guide RNAs from my screen target. We're going across this to a CD23 Cree, which will delete CDV3 in mature B cells and allow me to investigate the role of CDV3 in B cell differentiation. We're also going to cross this to an MB1 Cree to determine whether CDV3 also has a role in B cell development and B cell maturation. And ultimately, I'll use both of these models to investigate the role that CDV3 has in the antibody response to infection. We're just starting to get the first through knockout mice coming through now, so I'll soon be able to begin answering some of these questions. So far, I've shown you that I've used this screen to identify regulators of differentiation, division, and survival. But the main reason for performing this screen in an arrayed format in contrast to a more traditional pooled CRISPR screen, is that it allows me to assess the influence of genes on antibody secretion. In addition to using flow cytometry to examine cell number and phenotype, I also performed ELISAs on the culture supernatants to measure antibody concentration and identify regulators of antibody secretion. Antibody secreting cells perform a really staggering amount of antibody, antibody synthesis. So much so that approximately 70% of all gene transcription that occurs in these cells is antibody transcripts. Compare this to B cells, where the B cell receptor transcripts only account for around 2% of the transcriptome. If you measure the amount of antibody being produced by these cells, you can see that depending on the isotype, these cells produce between 2 and 8 picograms of antibody per cell per hour. To allow these cells to handle this massive secretory output, during differentiation, they undergo extensive cellular remodeling and massively expand their endoplasmic reticulum. As I mentioned in my introduction, B cells make a membrane-bound form of antibody called the B cell receptor, while antibody secreting cells make the secreted form. This switch between membrane and secreted form is due to the use of alternate polyadenylation sites. When this distal polyadenylation site is used, this results in the production of a longer transcript encoding a transmembrane domain, while when the weaker proximal site is used, this results in the secreted form. This mRNA is then translated and enters the ER, where it will undergo protein folding and post-translational modifications such as disulfide bond formation and glycosylation. Following this, the antibody needs to be transported through the Golgi and to the plasma membrane where it can be secreted. There are multiple stages in this antibody secretion process that could be regulated by genes within the antibody secreting cell gene signature. And in reflection of this, I had a total of 35 genes that dropped out as affecting antibody secretion. Some of these genes are already known to be important. As I showed in my differentiation results, SEC61A1, PRDM1, and IRF4 knockout cells can't differentiate. And if you can't differentiate, you can't secrete antibodies. XBP1 is a master regulator of the unfolded protein response, and we already know that XBP1 knockout cells can't secrete antibody. ELL2 is important because it promotes the use of that weaker proximal polyadenylation site, which results in the production of the shorter secreted transcripts. 
There are other hits from this screen that have a known function that easily explains why targeting them would affect antibody secretion. This group of genes, for example, are all involved in endoplasmic reticulum homeostasis by promoting the correct protein folding within the ER and promoting the degradation of misfolded proteins. And these genes have previously been implicated in post-translational modifications, with FUT1 being involved in, involved in fucosylation and DDoS, DHDDS, and DPAGOT1 all being involved in the synthesis and attachment of N-link glycosylation. If we overlay these genes onto the ER protein processing pathway, you can see that hits from my screen map to almost every stage of this process. I've labeled the genes that are hits from my screen in red. The genes that are in gray are genes that are within the antibody secreting cell gene signature, but did not have a measurable effect on antibody secretion in my screen. There are several reasons why these genes drop out as being essential. It could be technical reasons, such as the guides against this gene may not be effective, or the effect that they have on secretion is too subtle to be detected by the assay that I've used. Alternatively, there may be a lot of redundancy in this pathway, and only targeting one of these genes at a time may not reveal their function. Or there may actually be a specific pathway for antibody secretion. Either way, these results suggest that these genes that did drop out from my screen might represent potential weak links in this antibody secretion process that could be potentially exploited therapeutically for conditions where we want to reduce the secretion of pathogenic antibodies, such as in autoimmune diseases. There are a handful of other hits that have a known function that make sense as to why they would affect antibody secretion. BET1 is involved in transport from the ER to the Golgi. DNAJC3 and YAS are both involved in protein translation. BCKDK and ENPP1 are linked to metabolism, and TMM66 regulates calcium homeostasis within the ER lumen. But these remaining genes, however, either don't have a known function, or if their function is known, it isn't clear how this would relate to antibody secretion. And it's the genes within this group that I'm particularly interested in trying to work out how they fit into that antibody secretion pathway. There are multiple stages in the pathway that these genes could be regulating, but the first thing I checked was whether these cells were actually able to make high quantities of antibody. To do this, I took my guide transduced cells, fixed permeabilized them, and then labeled both the intracellular and extracellular membrane bound IgM. This way, the total amount of antibody being produced by these cells is labeled. By comparing the mean fluorescence intensity or MFI of IgM, you can see that of all of the genes I selected for follow-up work, only XBP1 affected the cell's ability to produce high quantities of antibody. Given the total amount of antibody being produced was unaffected, I next investigated whether the switch from producing membrane-bound to secreted form of antibody was altered. This is showing the MFI of IgM from transduced cells where only the extracellular membrane-bound IgM is labeled. As you can see, only ELL2 caused an increase in the amount of membrane brown IgM. And this makes sense as we know that ELL2 is a driver of that switch from using the alternate polyadenylation site. So together, these results suggest that of the genes I chose to follow up with, only ELL2 affected this transcriptional switch in usage of polyadenylation sites and only XBP1 affected the cell's ability to increase protein synthesis and protein folding capacity. These additional genes did not appear to affect the cell's ability to generate high quantities of antibody and are likely acting somewhere downstream to affect the ability of these cells to export the antibody from the ER through the GOE and to the plasma membrane for secretion. So I've identified a number of positive regulators of plasma cell generation and function. But what about negative regulators? Up until this point, I've been looking at genes that positively regulate this process, but this is only one side of the equation. While there are factors like BLIMP1 and IRF4 that drive differentiation forward, there are also factors that prevent differentiation and maintain B cell identity. PAX5 is often referred to as the master regulator of B cells as it's required for commitment to the B cell lineage and for maintaining B cell identity, 
BUC2 is a key negative regulator of B-cell differentiation as it has a role in preventing the expression of BLIMP1. If you activate BUC2 knockout B-cells, they will differentiate earlier and to a greater extent than wild-type B-cells. B-cells and antibody-secreting cells are regulated by two mutually antagonistic genetic networks. Factors that maintain B-cell identity, like Pax5 and BUC2, repress the expression of plasma cell genes. Conversely, after differentiation, plasma cell genes like BLIMP1 repress the expression of B-cell genes. I really wanted to get a better understanding of how these two opposing networks are regulated, so I designed a CRISPR screen to identify novel regulators of this differentiation process. Just as targeting positive regulators like BLIMP1 and IRF4 causes a reduction in differentiated cells, targeting negative regulators should result in an increase. To investigate this problem, I used a similar system to my original screen, but with two key differences. Firstly, as I'm not looking at antibody secretion, I didn't need my infection rates to be as high. So I modified this screen by introducing my guide RNAs into unactivated cells. This will also allow the genes to be targeted earlier in this differentiation process. Secondly, I used the culture conditions of LPS in interleukin-4. This will result in a lower rate of differentiation than using LPS alone. And together, these two changes should make it clear to identify negative regulators of this process. So as a proof that this system would be able to detect increases in differentiation and therefore be suitable to identify negative regulators, I transduced my Cas9 B cells with guide RNAs targeting BUC2 and cultured them in LPS and IL-4 for four days. The baseline differentiation rate for LPS and IL-4 was around 70% of cells being CD138 positive. And when you knock out BUC2, this increases to around 30%. So I can see an approximately four-fold increase in differentiation using this system. So this looks promising that this system will be suitable, suitable to identify novel regulators of differentiation, but which genes should I be looking at? Logically, negative regulators will not fall into the antibody secreting cell gene signature, so I needed to pick a different gene set to investigate. I was originally trying to do this screen using a po pooled whole genome approach, but to cut a long story short, I couldn't get this particular system working to a stage where this approach would be suitable. So during the first lockdown, I was thinking about other ways that I could approach this problem. I came up with a few ideas, such as using a different stimulation condition to try and minimize that baseline differentiation, or performing this screen on a cell line but it seemed obvious to me that I should try and use this system that I'd already optimized for my positive screens. With the help of Isabella Kong, we reanalyzed the RNA-seq data that the antibody secreting cell gene signature was isolated from, and we used the same criteria to select a list of genes that are down-regulated during differentiation. Once we had reopened, I came back and generated the library for the 172 down-regulated genes. Similarly to my screen for positive regulators, I arbitrarily set my cutoff for genes of interest as having a twofold increase in twofold increase in the proportion of differentiated cells compared to the uninfected controls from each plate. Using this cutoff, I identified 11 genes that increased B cell differentiation. You can see a clear increase in differentiation after targeting BUC2, ETS1, or PAX5 which are all known negative regulators of B-cell differentiation. There was also a few genes with a more modest increase in the proportion of CD138 positive cells, and I need to do some further validation experiments to determine whether these are truly increasing differentiation. This other gene, POLD1, caused a clear increase in differentiation, on par with the other known negative regulators of this process. POLD1 encodes the catalytic subunit of DNA polymerase delta. And finally, this screen also identified an additional gene, EEF181, which encodes a translation elongation factor and appears to be an additional positive regulator of this differentiation process. So just to put this all together, following activation, B cells undergo a burst of proliferation, 
This proliferation is impaired if you target CDV3, SUMO2, or HSBA5. After a few rounds of cell division, B cells can begin to differentiate. I've shown you today that IRF4, 661, PRDM1, and HSBA5 are all of the essential elements within the antibody secreting cell gene signature for this process to occur. I've also shown that in addition to BUC2, PAX5, and ETS1, POLD1 may represent a novel negative regulator of this differentiation process. And finally, I've identified more than 30 genes within the antibody secreting cell gene signature that appear to be essential for antibody secretion. And all of the candidates that I selected for follow-up work appear to be impacting secretion downstream of the ability of the cell to increase the antibody synthesis and are potentially blocking the export of antibodies from the cell. For the final part of my talk, I just want to change track a little bit. Up until now, I've been talking about using in vitro CRISPR screens to identify novel regulators of this pathway. But some of the other work that I've been doing throughout my PhD is looking at one of these often overlooked populations, and I've examined the role that the well-known plasma cell regulator IRF4 has in the generation of B1 cells. So B1 cells are slightly different to the follicular B cell population, which is what we're generally talking about when we talk about B cells. These cells are considered to be more innate-like. While follicular B cells are mainly found in the spleen and lymph nodes, B1 cells are the major B cell subset within the peritoneal cavity. This B1 population can be divided into two subpopulations on the basis of CD5 expression, with CD5 positive B1 cells being called B1A and CD5 negative being called B1B. B1 cells have a more restricted B cell receptor repertoire than follicular B cells, and they also display a more rapid response, proliferating and differentiating much sooner after activation than follicular B cells. And this innate-like population is responsible for the production of natural antibodies, which are the antibodies that are present in unchallenged organisms. This project originally started based on this observation that I made during an unrelated project before the start of my PhD. When you look at the B1 population within the peritoneal cavity of IRF4 knockout mice, you can see that this overall population is present at a similar frequency to wild-type mice. However, when you subdivide this population on the basis of CD5 expression, you can see that while in the wild-type mice, the majority of cells are the CD5-positive B1A population, this population is almost completely absent in the IRF4 knockouts, while the CD5-negative B1B population appears to be unaffected. The fir immediate first question I had was, is there a difference in IRF4 expression between these two subpopulations that could explain why only the B1A cells appear to be affected? To look at this, I used an IRF4 GFP reporter mouse, and as you can see, both B1A and B1B cells express IRF4 and at similar levels. So the answer as to why only B1A cells are missing isn't as easy as only the B1A population expresses IRF4. The next question I had was, is this population missing due to a block in their development? B1 cells and follicular B cells have a different developmental pathway. Unlike follicular B cells, which are generated in the bone marrow, B1 cells are mainly generated in fetal and neonatal life and have the capacity to undergo self-renewal. There are three stages of B1A cell development. Progenitor B1 cells, which are still able to develop into either B1A or B1B cells. Transitional B1A cells, which are now committed to the B1A fate and mature B1A cells. So I started off by looking at this first population, progenitor B1 cells. What I'm showing you here is the accepted staining for this progenitor, pro progenitor B1 population, which are quite a rare population of cells. As you can see here, this progenitor population is present in IRF4 knockout pups, and it's present at a similar frequency to wild type. So it doesn't appear, appear like this population is affected by the absence of IRF4. So I looked at the next stage in the developmental pathway. When I looked at the B1A transitional cells, which are now committed to becoming B1A cells, 
you can see that this population is almost completely absent in IRF4 knockout mice, suggesting that IRF4 is required for this developmental stage and that the absence of mature B1A cells is due to a developmental block. But you may have already been thinking, all of these observations are based on the expression of a single marker, CD5. CD5 is the only marker that we have to differentiate between B1A and B1B cells, and the identification of that transitional B1 population is also dependent on CD5 expression. So is this all simply a case that IRF4 regulates CD5? Or are B1A cells truly missing in these IRF4 knockout mice, or are they just unable to express CD5? To answer this question, I turn to RNA-seq. Before I go through these results, I just want to say that all of the RNA-seq analysis was done with the help of Isabella Kong. In this experiment, I took follicular B, B1A, and B1B cells from the wild type and IRF4 knockout mice. And the first question we asked was simply, where do these CD5 negative B1 cells from the IRF4 knockout mice sit? You can see that the wild type and knockout follicular B cells cluster together over here. Wild type B1A cells are up by themselves in this top corner. And the CD5 negative IRF4 knockout cells cluster with the wild type B1B, suggesting that this is a pure population of B1B cells in the knockout and not a mixture of B1B and B1A cells that lack CD5 expression. To look at this another way, this is a heat map showing the differences between wild type B1A and wild type B1B cells. When we place the knockout CD5 negative cells on this, they look pretty transcriptionally similar to the wild type B1B population, giving us further confidence that these knockout cells are true B1B cells. So now that we can confidently say that the B1A subpopulation is actually missing, the next question is why are they missing? Obviously, we can't look at the IRF4 knockout B1A cells because they're not there. So we compared the wild type and knockout B1B cells to try and get an idea of what IRF4 might be regulating in this population. As a starting point, I looked at the expression of genes that are already known to be important for the development or survival of B1A cells. You can see if we look at the genes that have previously been shown to be essential for B1A cell development, only two genes are significantly differently expressed between the wild type and knockout B1B cells. OCT2 is essential for the generation of peritoneal B1 cells, as OCT2 knockout mice don't have a peritoneal B1 population. In the absence of IRF4, we can see that OCT2 expression increases, which means it's unlikely that this is responsible for the loss of B1A cells that we see. BHLHE41 expression, on the other hand, is almost completely lost in the IRF4 knockout mice. What makes the expression of BHLHE41 particularly interesting, however, is that the BHLHE41 knockout mice have a very similar phenotype to what I'm seeing in the IRF4 knockout mice with respect to their B1 population. These BHLHE41 knockout mice have a complete absence of peritoneal B1A cells, while the B1B population appears to be unaffected. Looking at the development of B1A cells, it's been shown that in the absence of BHLHE41, you get a block in B1A development at that same transitional B1A stage as what I saw in the IRF4 knockouts. And these are some additional RNA-seq results I haven't shown you today, but the IRF4 knockout B1 cells have increased expression of negative regulators of B-cell receptor signaling and an increased expression of E2F targets. And these increases were also observed in BHLAG41 knockout B1 cells. And finally, we have some evidence that IRF4 might be directly regulating expression of BHLAG41. This is some previously published ChIP-seq data showing the binding of IRF4 onto the BHLAG41 locus in LPS-activated plasma blasts. It's previously been too difficult to do these experiments in B1 cells due to the low number of cells that can be obtained. But with recent advances, including cut and tag technology, it may be possible to determine whether this binding is also occurring in B1 cells. So just putting this all together, my current mechanism is that IRF4 directly induces expression of BHLHE41 in B1 cells. In the absence of IRF4, there is a block in B1A's development at the transitional B1A stage, meaning that those pro-B1 cells can now only become B1B cells. <laughs> 
resulting in an absence of the mature B1A population. And in the remaining time of my PhD, I'm attempting to prove this mechanism by seeing if the re-expression of BHLHE41 in IRF or knockout cells is sufficient to rescue this phenotype. So just to summarize everything that I've presented to you today, I've developed an arrayed screening system for primary mouse B cells and have performed a series of targeted screens. With this system, I've shown that there are very few elements within the antibody secreting cell gene signature that appear to be absolutely essential for B cell differentiation. I've also identified POLD1 as a potential novel negative regulator of this differentiation process. I've identified 10 genes that influence B cell division or survival, including CDB3, which is a novel regulator of B cell proliferation, and we've generated a knockout mouse model which will allow me to investigate this gene in more detail. I've identified over 30 genes that are essential for antibody secretion, many of which have no previous association with secretion. We believe that these genes that I have shown are potential weak links in the antibody secretion pathway could potentially be exploited therapeutically to manipulate antibody secretion. And finally, I've revealed a novel role for the transcription factor IRF4 in the generation of the peritoneal B1A population. And with that, I'd just like some to take some time to thank everyone that's either been involved in the projects I've presented today or in other work that I've done in my time at WEHI. Firstly, Steve, I have to thank you for taking me into your lab over six years ago now as an undergrad student. Thank you for keeping me around all this time and trusting me with this antibody secreting cell gene signature project. I really can't thank you enough for all of the advice and the guidance that you've given me throughout my time at WEHI. Simon, I'd like to thank you as well for all of your advice, both scientifically and life advice. Uh, working with you on both of these projects and in my honours year has just been incredible. And I'm really going to miss you when I leave WEHI and uh, we don't get to have our afternoon coffee gossip sessions anymore. Uh, to Joe, Marco and Axel, I truly appreciate all of the feedback and advice you've given me throughout my PhD. And the mice, uh, the Cas9 mice were from Marco and the GFP reporters were from Axel. Uh, to everyone in the Nut Lab, past and present, thank you for all of your feedback and ideas. I think you're all really incredible scientists and I truly feel grateful for being able to be a part of this group. And I think my work has really benefited a lot from being able to work with all of you. Uh, thank you to Andrew from the Herald Lab for generating the CDV3 knockout mice. Uh, thank you to every single person who's been through room 10 in the past few years. Uh, there has been a lot of you, but your assistance with animal work is just, I can't thank you enough. To uh, everyone in the immunology division as a whole, but I want to especially thank Miles, Ryan, Nadia and Amanda for all their advice with different elements of these projects and with technical assistance. To Izzy, Luke and Ange, you guys have made this entire PhD process so enjoyable. You've been great sounding boards for all of my ideas when I want to talk about science, and you've been there as a distraction when I don't want to. I do have to take an extra moment to single out Izzy. I think we've developed not only an amazing friendship, but a great scientific relationship over the past few years. As I said earlier, all of the RNA-seq data that I've shown you today and the generation of the negative regulator screen gene set was all done by Izzy. But there's a bunch of other stuff that we've been working on together that I haven't presented. I feel like in the future, even after we both leave WeHi, we will continue to collaborate with our different yet complementing ways of, ways of approaching the same problem. Thank you to all of my friends from outside of WeHi, especially those of you who are listening, even though you don't know the first thing about biology, uh, you guys have really kept me sane these past few years. And finally, I want to give the biggest thank you to my partner, Beck. Thank you for supporting me throughout this journey. Thank you so much for your patience and not getting mad at me when I'm in the lab till late or when I want to go in on the weekend. Although in my defense, you do usually come in as well. And thank you so much for listening to me talk about B-cells, even though it's so far removed from what you're working on. And thank you for listening to this practice talk over and over again. Uh, well done, Steph, on a fabulous talk. Um, you've got a few questions, and we've got very limited time, <laughs> so I'll try to go through them as quick as possible. Andreas had a suggestion that to say to study the role of CDV3 in pro B cells, 
um, the use of MB1 Cree may not work, and it's more of a comment, and it may be better to use RAG1 Cree for this population, so that's probably a good suggestion. Yeah, we could um, easily do that, I haven't generated those crosses sure. yet. <laughs> but you did have a lot of questions about the role of CDB3, so John Silk's been doing a lot of Googling, mm -hmm. and he's been looking at how far back in evolution is CDB3 conserved, He's then followed up to say that he's found it in sea urchin, and does that fit with a specialised role in B cells? Um, yeah, I guess the thing is, I don't really know what CDV3 is doing at all. Um, perhaps in mice it is a specialised B cell proliferation function, but earlier back it may just be a general cell division thing that's become more specialised. Um, Jane Bisvader has a question saying, given ABLE phosphorylate CDV3, what is the effect of ABLE knockout on antibody uh, secreting cells? Um, is this kinase required for CDV3 activity? I don't know whether it's required for CDV3 activity. Uh, the paper looking at it purely just showed that it was a target. It didn't do any kind of uh, functional assays at all. Um, in terms of the ABL knockouts, the ABL knockout B cells do have impaired proliferation, so it definitely links with a potential role in regulating CDV3 there. And Doug Hilton uh, wrote, absolutely beautiful talk, nothing better than a good screen, especially for negative regulators. Are uh, any or many of the new genes you identified, positive or negative, altered in the transition of a normal plasma cell into a myeloma? Uh, that's a good question. That's not something that I've looked at. Um, but yeah, that would definitely be worth investigating whether any of these regulators are altered in myeloma. And probably one of the last couple of questions, uh, Reese asked, do you know what the cellular localization of CDB3 is? No. Uh, we think it's cytoplasmic, uh, given that it has no uh, nuclear signaling sequence or transmembrane domains, but I haven't been able to show that just yet. And the last question for the day, could SUMO2 um, be affecting cell survival as, has been, as it has been shown to stabilise MCL1 protein? Yeah, I think SUMO2 is most likely affecting both. Uh, but as I said, unfortunately, using this system, I can't really assess survival accurately. If we had a SUMO2 knockout B cells or something, then I could definitely say that. I suspect that it would be affecting both proliferation and survival, though. Great. Um, well, with that, we're right on two o'clock, and that's all the questions um, that have been asked today. So could everyone please join me in thanking Stephanie for a fabulous seminar today. Thank you. <laughs> One clap. <laughs>